This episode is brought to you by VMGVinyl.com. Professional record cleaning, restoration, rejuvenation, and grading. Refresh your records with VMGVinyl.com. This episode is brought to you by Groove Washer, the best record cleaners and protective sleeves for your vinyl collection. Ask for the Groove Washer from your local shop or go to GrooveWasher.com. Discount code VinylGuide10. And now, on with the show. Welcome to The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. Here's your host, the biggest record nerd of them all, Nate Goyer. Hello, everyone. It's Nate. Oh, please forgive the gruff voice this week. I'm fighting off a cold. I'll keep the upfronts nice and short. You guys will hopefully enjoy that. Um, look, this week, we're talking with Tom Flynn of Boner Records. Now, Boner Records has an amazingly strong history with underground music in California and the West Coast in general, and they're still at it some 40 years later. Uh, the label started with the band Fang, which Tom was part of, and uh, along the way earned many, many fans, including a very young Kurt Cobain, who reportedly admired Fang and their music, especially the Landshark album, helped shape his art. Boner moved on to other bands, including Melvin's, Steel Pole Bathtub, The Mr. T Experience, the Boneless Ones, and more. And right now, Boner is currently releasing a new project from Antler Family. It's a new slash newish band Tom is part of. There's a limited vinyl pressing of 250 records up at antlerfamily.bandcamp.com. I put the link in this episode page. Grab one of those limited vinyl pressings if they're still available. Most of the stuff Tom makes sells out pretty quick, so get up there quick. Antler Family. Dot bandcamp dot com. Now, today, Tom talks all about his history of the record label, uh, the original tapeworm single on Hermaphrodite Records, making the Landshark LP, writing the song The Money Will Roll Right In, uh, having that song covered by Nirvana, signing Melvin's, making the Kiss parody albums, <laughs> the story of the Melvin's Lysol lawsuit, the band Duh, the hibernation of the label, and the recent awakening of Boner Records with the release of Antler Family. There's a lot of history here, people, so buckle up. I hope you enjoy the interview. So, here we go. We welcome to the Vinyl Guide podcast, Mr. Tom Flynn of Boner Records and Antler Family. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm okay. How's it going? All right. Got your coffee or your tea or whatever lubricant you need. I already uh, took care of all that. <laughs> okay. Cool. Look, I don't know if you know much about the show, Tom, but we do talk a, a bit about records. We don't go too nerdy. Hopefully we don't go too nerdy. But if it, there's some nerdy facts, then feel free to share. I'll, you know, we'll, we'll <laughs> dig around until we find the limit. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll nerd out when appropriate. Are, are you a bit of a record nerd, Tom? No, I'm not at all. <laughs> okay. Do you have a record collection? Do you play records at all? Uh, I have some records I own. I wouldn't call it a collection, but I... Uh, a smattering, uh, just a... smattering of records that have been accumulated over time, but, you know... Mm -hmm. I'm not a collector. I've never really been a collector. I just have always... I like the music, and I don't need to have the object as, as much, I guess. Okay. All right. Do you, do you play them that much, or are they just sitting in a, a box somewhere for years? Uh, I don't play the actual. I, I play the m most music I listen to is basically on my in my car or through you know. The, so I listen to the digital copies, and uh, I don't really sit around and play records. I guess unfortunately. Okay, life just got that way somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so, because uh, there's so many things that you've projects you've been involved in and uh i'm quite fascinated by it, especially being a melvin's fan and you know going back to some of the other bands that you were you were part of fang uh is one um i i recognize you also have this new antler family album right. um yeah. first off does boner records have a website uh no um because i mean by by the time it would have made sense i wasn't releasing any new product and so it just didn't uh it never never happened i mean i wish yeah. i did because i would try to do it in some weird funny way but uh just uh wouldn't make sense at this point 
All right, because it, it it isn't too late, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, just trying trying to find some information, especially on things like you know, like the antler family. I've had to rely on third parties, so I don't know what's real and what's not. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'll try not that, to lie too much to you. So. No, you could lie all you want. That's <laughs> fine. This, this is not a congressional record or anything. There's, <laughs> so talk, where did you start? I think you're you're West Coast in the U.S. Were you born in the in the Bay Area? Where you? No, from? I was born in uh, an East Coast in Connecticut near New York City, and um, the first uh, first real band I was in was called Tapeworm in high school, mm-hmm. and uh, we it was kind of started almost as a joke, but sort of not. It was like we just sort of discovered punk rock, and we were kind of interested in. We we liked that it would confuse all our classmates and uh, and all kinds of things. So this was a we we started basically just to have a band to play in our high school talent show and to like make everyone annoyed and angry at the talent show. And once that happened, we really uh, liked the the weird response we got, and uh, so we decided to make a single, which is a, a tapeworm single, which we did in high school. Which that is probably the most collectible thing I've ever done. Which uh, we had 200 copies made and uh, they've sold for like $2,000 a piece by now. And um, so that kind of gave us the idea, me the idea of, you know, oh, this is how you actually can make a record. There's no real magic to it. You know, you just find the plant and you give them some money and they'll make a record for you. You know, it wasn't <laughs> like a, some sort of weird voodoo that had to happen. So we did that. And then, uh, so that was my first opportunity of making a record. So so let, let, let's pause on that because that record, again, you said to yourself, very collectible. You made 200. Right. It's on Hermaphrodite Records. Yeah, well, that was, it was, you know, or the band was Tapeworm, so it was Hermaphrodite Records. You know, it was just sort of, a, the whole thing was just sort of made up as we went along, you know. You, you, you're you picking all sorts of points to, to, to provoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that was, that was the point, I guess. Yeah, yeah. we were... You know, new new to punk rock. It was in nineteen, I guess seventy seven when we when we really started playing, and the record was made in early seventy eight, and uh, and we were all I was I guess fifteen when we formed, and the other guys were sixteen or seventeen, and so it was all it was all new to us, you know. So you made this record. You made two hundred copies. Did you guys you guys had to pool your money together like the yeah actually the because uh, we. Uh, the other two guys in the band wanted to make wanted to spend some extra money to make 200 copies instead of 100 and i was like no no one's gonna want this thing and so i only wanted to make 100 so i actually put in less money and they put in more money and they got more more records for it you know so Mm -hmm. but uh yeah we should have made you know more (laughs) i guess there was a second press because the first pressing correct me if i'm wrong is the small hole one and right. then there's another pressing that's the same year or around that that's kind of the large hole one. No, that never happened. There might have been boot there was probably there was some bootleg maybe ten or so years ago or maybe something like that. I don't know what kind of hole that one had. <laughs> and then um then there was an official re release, which we didn't do, but um Death Vault Records in Canada put it out. That was about five years ago, right? But there was no, there was no other, there was no second pressing we made back then for sure. Oh, okay, all right. And so, there was no bootlegs back then because no one was interested at all until, <laughs> until it was revived, like in the late nineties. So. I've I've got a plan for riches. Let's bootleg this high school <laughs> punk band. <laughs> um. Okay, so I, I I hate to contradict you, but there are there are two versions from back in the day. One is a small hole, one is a large hole. I'll send you this information if you if I have. If you yeah, have I've never uh, I've never experienced or seen that. I don't know what that would be. But. Oh, okay. No worries. Well, maybe one is a bootleg, or maybe one is maybe your bandmates made another pressing behind your back since you were so. Stop cheap. telling me they've been <laughs> they've been raking in the money and flipping uh, with me. And the first pressing, correct me if I'm wrong, it's 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 a colored pressing. It's it's a bluish pressing, is that right? Uh it's weird. It's it's black vinyl, but 
I don't know if it's some, just some cheap vinyl or what, because when you hold it up to the light, it looks kind of purplish. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's just black vinyl as far as, I mean. That's what you guys not, paid for. You thought a black vinyl. Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, we didn't pay for any colored vinyl. I mean, it's really black, but when you, like I said, it's, it was weird. We always noticed that when you, like, held it up behind, you know, up to a light, it would seem kind of purplish. Oh, okay. We didn't know we thought that was just because the vinyl was so cheap or something or other. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, added bonus. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So, Tapeworm goes on to conquer America, as we all know. Um, what were your next steps after that? Uh, well, then, uh, the next year in high school, is a band called Safety Patrol with uh, one of the other guys from Tapeworm, but we never released any product. Then I moved away after the high school. <clears throat> after high school, I moved away to California. And in 1980, uh, I formed the band Fang with uh, with my friend Brian from high school, who was also in, in Tapeworm. And it was formed originally just as a duo. And in early 1981, we, uh, we recorded a 7-inch, which we released, um, mm-hmm. you know, to, to no interest whatsoever, <laughs> as, as, as it seems to be a pattern. You know, there's no interest whatsoever. <laughs> so you moved across America. Was it for music reasons, personal reasons, or a little of both? It was, uh, it was personal. I mean, I left high school and I moved to Chicago to supposedly go to college, but I I dropped out of Northwestern University in Chicago after just a few weeks and I moved out to California. I knew someone who, someone I went to high school with lived out in California. So I moved out there to to stay with them Mm -hmm. because I didn't, uh, I just, I mean, and then the other option was going back home to my parents' house and that didn't. Who wants to do that? (laughs) Yeah. So. But you moved out with a bandmate, or at least one of your old bandmates was there. So there must have been some sort of well. He he, I didn't move out with him, but he joined me. He moved to Texas, and then he joined me like a year later. So I was in contact with him. Then he was futzing around in Texas, and he couldn't get anything going there. So he mm-hmm. moved out to join me in California. So with this new single, the uh, Fang, the band Fang, what, enjoy the view, Yukon Fang. Right. With that record, that actually had a picture sleeve as well. Yeah, big time picture sleeve. We're really going up in the world. <laughs> it's a well, that's a big cost, especially for a small band now living in San Francisco. Um, so, uh, so there must have been some strong confidence behind that for you as well. Uh, well, we just, uh, I don't know. We just, we, we figured it was a way to get some interest in the band, you know, like we didn't know what else to do. And so we, uh, we had we released a single. I think we had both made that tapeworm single, so we were familiar with the concept of making a single, and uh, so it seemed like the obvious thing to do. How how would you sell those singles? Like uh, going back to tapeworm, I mean, just friends at school. Tapeworm, we would just sell it to friends of ours at school, or you know, our parents, or just to anyone. We didn't really sell that many. They'd be a dollar a piece, and you know, so I all of these high school friends that have all gotten rich off their tapeworm singles because they've been selling them for $1,500 and stuff. And they're very thankful and pleased that we could, <laughs> we could do that for them. Um, yeah. So those, we didn't sell to any distributor or anything like that. The Fang singles, well, when we released it, we went on a, a tour of some sorts around the country. So we'd sell them at shows there. And also we'd go into the local record stores and, uh, sell them there and i know eventually we only made 500 so eventually i sold a big box of them to uh to rough trade the distributor and they uh did something with them Mm -hmm. (laughs) who knows (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they did. They paid me money for them. It's up to them. <laughs> yeah, it's their business now. So going from that single to then that now that wasn't Boner Records. What was that? No, it didn't. It didn't exist at all then. How, how did Boner Records come to be? Because that's well, it just thing. was a way because when Fang uh, the membership shifted around, and by 1982, when we recorded the, the Land Shark uh, record. We had sort of vaguely thought about trying to get someone else to release a record, but uh, we kind of looked around and eventually I just said, well, you know, I can just 
do it myself would make the most sense and probably be the easiest way to do it. And at the time, I had no concept that this would be an ongoing record company. It was just a way to put the record out of my band. And the name was just because I lived on the street called Bonar Street in Berkeley. And so it was just amusing, you know, we called it Boner Street. And so it was Boner Records on Boner Street. And there it goes. And uh, and I found out by doing that that I really enjoyed the whole process of releasing records. And uh, and so I kept it going from there. Mm. Did, did you prefer that sort of uh, function in music to playing and touring? No, I didn't. Uh, I no, I, I prefer playing, but um, I couldn't really find the right people to play with. I think so. I kind of got away from it and just started releasing, releasing the records that way. I think because I sort of like to be in charge of things, like to be the decision maker. And being in a band, you can't really unless you want to be a total asshole about it, you can't order everyone around what to do, you know? So right. uh, having, owning a record company, being the sole employee, you really got to do whatever the, whatever you want. <laughs> mm-hmm. It it seems to me uh, Boner was set up just for your personal releases, but at some point you start bringing on other bands, ones you weren't part of. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I put the, we did the first two, Bang Records, and then uh, there was this uh, Special Forces album, which was sort of a weird thing because I just was friends with the people in the band, and they were going to be putting up all the money for it, and they just wanted me to help them sell it, and I was I sort of said, okay, sure, you know, that's that's fine, and then after that, uh, I had quit Fang, so I wasn't in Fang anymore. So then I still like putting out the record. So I decided to make that uh, Boners Be Poppin' compilation in 1985, which mm-hmm. had the six bands on it. So just prior to Fang, the album, the, the Landshark album, Fang was also part of a, a Alternative Tentacles compilation. Right. All Not So Quiet on the Western Front, I think. I got a copy right. somewhere around here. Yeah. How did you get involved in that? And and were there any lessons you learned from working with Alternative Tentacles that you you brought back to Boner Records? Uh, well, not any lessons. We got involved because they uh, it was Maximum Rock and Roll was putting it together. Mm-hmm. Um, the various people involved: Tim Hannon and Ruth Schwartz and uh, Biafra and uh, maybe Ray Farrell. I'm not sure who was involved with picking bands, but I think. Uh, uh, they were picking, you know, every single, there's 47 bands. They were picking like almost every band that existed in the Bay Area. Um, I think it was, it might have been Biafra who picked, who who sort of picked us because I don't think like Timmy Hannon and Jeff Bale, they were more interested in things that were, if it wasn't political, they weren't interested. <laughs> um, you know, if the, if the lyrics weren't about, El Salvador or Ronald Reagan or, you know, something along those lines, they said, what's the point? Um, And Biafra was more interested in kind of weirder sort of music. And so I think it was, I think it was through him that we got on the album, although I'm not really sure. And uh, we weren't really, it was never, we never dealt with alternative tentacles directly. It was always just handing Tim Yohannan basically the tape and uh, they took it from there. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I know we were supposed to. Alternative Tentacles gave everyone instructions on how to like copyright the songs or do some. I don't know. There's some reason they wanted everyone to have to fill out this legal garbage to in order to you know. They it, it was strange because no other labels really bothered with any of that, mm-hmm. and I don't think it was there's any point to it. I think they might have read a book that said they were supposed to do this or, or something or other. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I didn't really uh, didn't get any direct inspiration from. It. I got inspiration from it, but I didn't get any direct like clues on how to run a record company. But it's just sort of they were. I saw they were a record company that was around. You know, an exa- mm-hmm. another example of being able to do it yourself, I guess. Because just printing your records and getting them out there, and 
learning organically, it's a, it's, it's a pretty slow process and, you know, can be rife with mistakes, which I'm sure there are mistakes made, but yeah, I, I guess at some point you, you would have had to have had some sort of perhaps guidance or seen how someone else was running a record company and started taking lessons from that. Does, does that? Well, I mean, I guess it came from various places. I know probably I asked, uh, I asked around like, you know, where, where do you get your records pressed and where do you get your covers made? I think I talked to Steve Tupper subterranean and, uh, uh, maybe alternative tentacles, maybe the guy there, uh, forget who was doing it. There was this guy microwave. He might've been, in I can't remember. So yeah, I might've got just various addresses and phone numbers. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, various people would hear about where you can get the records distributed. So there was systematic and rough trade where it could, they'd, you know, they'd take your records and sell them to stores. And so it kind of was a gradual process of different people telling me different stuff and finding yeah. out what worked yeah. and what didn't. But then you had, I mean, cause you, you built up enough knowledge or at least people thought you had enough knowledge to where bands like special forces were coming to you and saying, Hey, help us out, man. Right, right, yeah. They said, "Well, yeah, we're gonna have this thousand records, and what do we do with them?" And I'm like, right. "Well, I, I can sell them to Systematic. They'll take twenty five, you know, or whatever." And you know, that's wow, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do that. So that's how you were kind of getting like Land Shark out there through Systematic and a few other distributors. You just made these relationships and just started working. Yeah, yeah. Well, Systematic or Rough Trade were the easy ones because they were in San Francisco, so they were the first easy ones. And then from then, I. I don't remember. I started selling to important, uh, well, you know, the relativity in New York and, uh, geez, there's green world in Los Angeles. And I don't know, I'd gradually, and you know, I'd hear, I'd see either advertisements in magazines or I'd see like other people were distributed through these places. And so I'd call them up and I just figured the more distributors, the better. Um, until a few years later, I found out that a lot of them just go out of business and <laughs> don't pay you. And so yeah. it kind of screwed me up after a while. What, were, you, were you kind of making a little bit of money early on or at least not going backwards? Yeah. Well, the like, yeah, the Fang records would uh, slowly, I mean, it kind of broke even after a year or so. And, you know, from then it was making money. And so it was, uh, I was lucky enough that the first thing that I put out actually, you know, wasn't a money loser. Right. Okay. Now that first album, Land, uh, Land Shark, I mean, it opens up with "The Money Will Roll Right In," which is such a uh, fantastic song. It's a, it's an anthem. That song seems to have developed a life of its own. What do you remember about making that song? Uh, well, uh, we, we Fang did it. We recorded it actually before our, our singer Sam joined. Not recorded it, but we wrote it before our singer Sam joined. And uh, it was actually our bass player Chris had the music sort of. He had this sort of weird thing that he was doing in his old band, and he's actually they were doing it as a cover of Elvis Presley's Heartbreak Hotel. And he was playing this that bass line of bar 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 bar, and so somehow I think, and then I had written the lyrics. Uh, I still actually have the old notebook where I wrote the lyrics. It's pretty funny to see that recently. And um, somehow, eventually, I just fit. I arranged his music to fit the lyrics, and uh, it was one of our. Uh, yeah, it actually was so, sort of a real memorable thing right from when we first started playing it because originally. Chris was playing bass and I was playing guitar and singing. And so I would be singing it. And then, uh, and then pretty soon after that, Sam joined and then we recorded a version of it. And, uh, it, uh, yeah, it uh, really has uh, like been almost an albatross around my neck with this song that it's the thing that everyone wants to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not want to talk about it? Is that no, no, I'm entirety? happy to talk about it. It's just, it's just funny. Like everyone, does everyone come to me? Hey, did the money roll right in? Blah, blah, blah. Oh. Just, like, enough with it. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, I imagine though, it was an immediate fan favorite. It's. I, th I think so. I must've been. I and mean, when we put it first on the record, we kind of knew it was, uh, you know, the catchiest thing on there. And uh, I'm sure we played it every single show. But the good thing about it, I remember we got people to, uh, 
before we played it, we got people to throw money at us <laughs> on stage, especially on tour. And so it really helped like people would be throwing coins and we'd get to <laughs> scoop them all up and, you know, be able to buy some top ramen that night or whatever, you know. <laughs> so you so use it, good, it as it was a, a gimmick. Good gimmick in that way. Now that song is gone on and in uh, it was covered by Nirvana. Uh, yeah. At the probably the height of their powers uh, and released on a, I think the Reading live album. Is that right. something, is that kind of like a, 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 how did, did your life change due to that? Was there any? Mm, no, it didn't. I didn't even actually know about it for like five or more years after, after it happened. I had kind of, I'd kind of seen weird things online saying, you know, Nirvana playing the Money Well Right In, but I thought people were confused and it was actually Mud Honey because Mud Honey recorded a version also. Hmm. So I thought people were referring to that. So I didn't really, it wasn't really definite that it actually happened until uh, Universal actually contacted me when they were actually planning on finally releasing it. And, you know, getting the rights and all the other stuff. So that was when I really knew it happened. But it wasn't, uh, so it wasn't like an immediate uh, anything, really. I, you know, it was uh, it was a nice thing to happen, but uh, it didn't really, mm -hmm. didn't make me a millionaire, that's for sure. Nice. Did they play it just that once, or was it kind of part of their set for a while? I think they played it a few times. I'm not really sure. I know they, see, they played it a few times. I think they actually... And then sometimes they'd played it where when Kurt would get on stage with Mud Honey and he would like sing it while they played. And so that's why I thought that's why I was confused when people were saying Nirvana did it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think they did it more than once, but I'm I'm not really sure if there's other recordings of it or, or what. Okay. All right. Because Kurt, Kurt loved Fang, from what I understand. Yeah, I never talked to him about it i mean i met him briefly a few times you know in various places but he never mentioned fang to me but uh mm -hmm. i don't know if he ever saw us when we were up in seattle or not it was probably a little before his time because we were up there with me anyway i was we were up there in like 1984 and so he might have still been 15 years old i don't, I don't really remember right okay all right because yeah he listed land shark as one of his um, I guess foundational records. Right, right, so, yes, yeah. So and then of course we also know he he had a love of Melvin's, which <laughs> you know. I think he identified himself as a Melvin's roadie even <laughs> through some of his yeah, Nirvana. I think, I think that's what people say. And I think what it really I mean, people call themselves roadies, like, you know, he rode in the van with them to their show and probably helped them carry an amp inside if that mm -hmm. That means being an official roadie. I don't know. You know usually, it's just because you'll get in free, you know, or something. Right. So, starting to work with Melvins. How did Melvins come on your radar, and how did they end up on Boner Records? We'll be back after these messages. Well, hey there, record collectors. There's a new service available that specializes in record cleaning, restoring, sticker removal, and professional grading. VMGVinyl.com VMG Vinyl can help you make the most of your collectible records. From professional cleaning of records and sleeves, removing old price tags and store stickers, dry cleaning and rejuvenation of old shrink wrap to make it look like new, even providing you a professional play-tested third-party grade with either removal grading or encasing in plastic you have a wide range of choices at vmgvinyl.com buying a highly collectible record and you want it checked out by an expert vmg vinyl can do that too head over there now and see what vmgvinyl.com can do for you and your collection that's vmgvinyl.com the one-stop shop for professional third-party grading cleaning and record restoration that's vmgvinyl.com Oh, and hey, record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by name at your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code VINYLGUIDE. 10. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code VINYLGUIDE10. 
now we return to the program already in progress. No limits. No excuse. So we're starting to work with Melvins. How did Melvins come on your radar and how did they end up on Boner Records? Uh, that was um, in 1988. This friend of mine, Stephanie Sargent, who was the original guitarist in uh, Seven Year Bitch from Seattle, if you're mm-hmm. familiar with them. Mm-hmm. She moved down. I met her through Fang a few years before that. Anyway, she moved down from Seattle to San Francisco. And so she was hounding me about putting out a new a Melvin's thing. And I'd I had heard of them and sort of, but I didn't really know much about them. And she gave me a tape of the gluey porch treatments. And I was kind of blown away by that. That was like, you know, great. Okay, yeah, let's do a record right away. Mm-hmm. Um, so I met the Melvin soon after that, and uh, their only their only requirements for the record, they wanted it in a 24 track studio, and they wanted to bring Mark Dutram, who had produced Glee Port Treatments, in to produce it, and he was living in England then, so he had to fly. He wanted to fly Mark Dutram over from England, and they wanted to do it in 24 track studio because. Buzz said he really liked the way Glee Poor Treatments came out and he wanted it to be just as good or better sounding than that. And so that was the only requirements. And I was like, okay, sure, we can do that. You know, and that's what we did. So it was recorded in San Francisco. And you, it, it was and- recorded in San Francisco, yeah, and I think May, May 89, really quick because they do everything first takes pretty much. They're just like, you know, they're super supernatural musicians i guess they just you know have everything down they've been probably rehearsing the stuff every day all day for you know a year and so they just came in and blam so even back then they were super disciplined coming in and just knocking yeah them. yeah they uh it was uh yeah there was no fooling around it was just you know bam 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 all done and do you recall what mark added to the sessions how he colored it in uh mark added a uh, snobby attitude <laughs> that's that was that was his main contribution in my mind but no he uh he i know he liked to use a lot of room ambience room mics around so that right. that was nice gave a good uh sort of roomy sound osma sounded ended up sounding a little strange when i hear it now but uh other than that, I mean, he was uh, Laurie, the bass player's old boyfriend, and he he knew them all real well. And so uh, it was all friendly, easy going, you know. But mm. uh, I know uh, there was a bit of a little thing at the end where he all of a sudden out of the blue asked me for, he said, well, what about my fee? <laughs> and I was mm. like, what are you talking about, your fee? <laughs> He's like, well, I'm my fee for producing the record. I was like... Oh, well, this is the first I've heard about this. But uh, I said, I just thought we were supposed to bring you over from England. He's like, well, yes, but then I need the fee for producing. And so we, uh, I think we, we worked it out. <laughs> we okay. Slip him a few hundred dollars and okay, fine. Here's your fee. Okay. And and the reception of Osma, how was it uh, originally? This is 89, right? Yeah, it came out the uh, fall of 89. Uh, yeah, fall of 89. It was a, uh, it had a lot of interest right away. I mean, there was the whole the sub pop thing was really just sort of taken off at the time. And so they had the Seattle connection and they had, uh, you know, their old bass player plays in Mud Honey now. And it was just all this automatic connection that uh, really made the thing sell right away Mm -hmm. i mean made made people interested and then once they heard it they were like great you know give me more okay and they were touring around really working the record yeah well they they toured they did some west coast stuff and then they were they were going to tour in uh the spring of 1990 and then soon before there was they were leaving i think it was all set up laurie couldn't leave with them so they asked me to do it because they knew i could they were friends with me and they knew I was around and I could play. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, so then I ended up doing that tour in like May and June of 1990, which was a lot of fun. There was a lot of interest in good shows and stuff. Were you involved in any of the cover artwork 
for example, Ozma or Eggnog or Bullhead? Was that anything you weighed not, in on? Not really. Uh, uh, the Ozma cover was just sort of almost, it was almost traced from a book and then colored in and changed around, but uh, I had nothing to do with it. And the back cover was, yeah, just uh, Buzz's handwriting and that, that was uh, nothing I was involved in. Bullhead. Uh, I mean, I probably did the typesetting and things and the layout and stuff, but it was never, it was always the Melvin in charge of what it was going to look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's always the minimum way it's for every record I put out is pretty much the band has said, here's what this is going to be. Do this, do this, do this, and this, and, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll do the paste ups and do stuff, but uh, it's just grunt work. It's not really creative work, I guess. So as, as the guy kind of run the label when you're cutting checks when a band comes to you with an album cover do you i guess i don't want to say judge it but do you think about like okay is this going to help sell the record is this <laughs> is, is it a concern of yours at all yeah um but uh it's kind of like there's nothing i can do about it if that's what they want i think i'm trying to think of when i've had anything to say about it I know uh, when Steel Pulbasa put out the Lurch record, they didn't have their name on it anywhere. On the f And so I said, well, that's not the best idea because, you know, people will flip by it in a store and won't see it. So actually, I got them to put stickers on the front. That was uh, the, only, the only thing there. I'm trying to think if there's any other... And there was an Ed Hall record, which didn't really have their name on the front either, but it had their name really big on the back. So that was like, okay, it's really big on the back. Fine. That's good enough. But yeah, uh, I've never had a, like a, a disagreement artistically about like this, this particular art isn't any good or this art won't help sell the record. It's more, the only thing I can think of is, yeah, well, your name should be on there. Right. Okay. So when Melvin's came to you with the idea for the solo records, the in the parody right. on the Kiss solo records, what do you remember that conversation? What was your reaction? Uh, I don't remember particularly, but yeah, I thought it was funny and uh, let's do it. You know, uh, I mean, by that point, uh, anything they made was there was no financial risk because I mean it would. You know, it was not going to be a money loser, whatever they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was a great idea. I mean, it was sort of a, such a weird, stupid idea that it was uh, perfect for them. <laughs> the the artwork of those records, I mean, it really looks like the Kiss artwork. I, I, yeah. I, it wouldn't surprise me if it was the same art, if you got the same artist to be able to do it. Yeah, we got this, uh, this guy actually that uh, we knew well, this guy Harvey Stafford. And just, they uh, they wanted him to do the three front covers and, that, and then the three posters, too. And they had the solo albums, you know, to show him. And they did it. The only the way they paid him was they played a show in his loft, his birthday party, his birthday party in his loft. They played and he got to pick the set list like he got to pick all the songs that they would play. And so that was the, you know, that was the only payment that, uh, that, <laughs> that he needed. Although now he's probably sold the artwork too, but, uh, yeah, at the time it was, uh, it was a good deal for everyone involved. <laughs> <laughs> so the artwork stayed with him. You don't have the original artwork of that. No. Okay. Does that ever come in be problematic if you do reissues or anything? Well, normal, I'm trying to think. Uh, it has never come up to be a problem. That Melvin's art was weird because uh, I think there was an issue with it where that Melvin's artwork, I had it. Like, you know, when when we put the records out, I had the paintings. And so then just I just stored it with all the other artwork, you know, that I had. And then and Harvey came in one day, like sort of demanding it, back and i was like uh, okay i guess so i, I don't know i didn't have it had been something i never really thought about mm -hmm. and so i said okay i guess i don't need it <laughs> i mean sure take it but i 
for any reissues, it's always been, you've always been able to recreate things that you've gone, even if it's going from the next generation of the artwork, you know, whatever. there's never really been a, a problem. Hmm. Okay. And in any of has, the- hasn't really been any, I'm trying to think of any other record that has been like any kind of fine art that someone has done just for the record. A lot of times it's just stolen stuff, you know, from right. Matt or whatever but there's a lot of records that it, it, and these days they get re, you know reissued i don't think anyone expected to be reissuing vinyl you know 40 years later but as as they make these these records some of the problems of getting a really good copy of the original artwork yeah i can imagine when we did the uh the melvin's reissues luckily uh buzz's wife mackie took care of all the artwork and uh, she kind of redid most of them all. I'm not sure. She might have like scanned some of them and altered them, or she kind of recolored them and did kind of weird stuff to them. So it all is, you know, it's, whatever she did, it worked. I don't know. <laughs> okay, it's out of my hands, and I was happy about it. <laughs> so Boner Records, it, it tends to go, from my perspective, it, it, you had a lot of releases. Then it goes quiet. Then every so often, another release comes out. So it's it's Boner Records has always been in business it's just sometimes more active than others yeah well i was actively putting out releases till like uh 96 i guess the last one was a superconductor bastard song d- <laughs> double lp that was mm-hmm. the last was double lp with a gold on the cover and also embossed and just a <laughs> right. very elaborate anyway and then after that i didn't really put anything out new wise till like 20 years later i don't you know mm-hmm. uh but it's always been in business as far as everything most things have still been in print you know a lot of the vinyl is sold out but uh everything is available digitally of course but also there's still cds and sets and some vinyl of things still available of everything okay every few years you have to reprint melvin stuff some of the more popular titles yeah, like uh, I've had to keep repressing Melvin CDs pretty constantly every few years, and uh, and then the Melvin's vinyl, which was which was re released, started to be re released. Uh, I don't know when that was five or six years ago, yeah. and so those have all gone through a bunch of pressings on those, and uh, anything anything that makes sense to sell to press five hundred more copies of, I'll press five hundred more copies of. You know, so that, uh, mm-hmm. there's no. Uh, you know, the only reason not to is if I'm not going to press five hundred copies, if it's going to sell ten. Right. Oh, fair enough. So, what are your recollections around the Lysol fiasco? <laughs> uh, bad ones. Um, uh, yeah, I, but they came to me with this. Uh, they wanted to, to call the record Lysol, and I didn't really think anything of it, just because. You know, punk rock bands have, they put all kinds of stuff, you know, no one cares. You put these copyrighted stuff or parodies and all kinds of garbage on records. And, you know, it's such on a low level that no one really gives a shit and no one bothers you about it. So I didn't think there'd be any problem at all with it, really. Um, And then eventually a lawyer popped up at the door with a big stack of papers explaining, you know, how Lysol is the copyright of this and this and that, and it's a very, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you, you need to immediately cease and desist and destroy all copies. And we need you to come in for a deposition and all this other stuff. So it was uh, a big uh, hassle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my main concern at the time was because the name Lysol didn't really matter. It was just sort of a random name buzz through on there. Yeah. And luckily it wasn't printed anywhere. It was only, it was printed on the outside cover and on the spine, but it wasn't on any inserts. It wasn't on the actual label of the record or anything. So my main concern was I did not want to have to destroy. I think it was, I think I'd made probably eight, 8,000 or so CDs and 5,000 records and 2,000 cassettes. And I didn't want to have to throw all that stuff in the garbage because it was probably worth twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and so we had to negotiate with these lawyers, these legal people that 
humorless, you know, to the max, just, uh, you know, trying to, uh. anyway, so I had to go, I had to go to court. It was not like a, a suit. It was like, a just, I had to go with the, their lawyer and be in front of a judge. It was like, uh, I forget what the legal term is, but anyway, we went in there and had to say what was going to happen. And in court, the bad thing was on our first meeting, I basically committed perjury because I, I said, well, I don't understand because this, this release is not, hasn't come out yet. It's not even made yet. Nothing's happened yet. And so, you know, what's the point? I won't put it out and, you know, let's forget all about it. And then the, uh, and the lawyer said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, in three weeks, we'll have another status conference and see what's going on. And then out in the hallway, the awful lawyer turned to me and said, look, I know that you lied in there. And uh, you want me to tell you how I know? And I was like, yeah, I guess I'm interested in that. And he took out a picture of the actual CD that said Lysol on it. And I was very confused as to how the fuck did he get a picture of the CD? And they've only been in our warehouse like what did he break into the warehouse what is going on and eventually i figured out from reading all the documents that they had hired some private investigator in new york and he had called me claiming to write for some magazine in new york asking for an advanced copy and at the time the melvins were going to be playing in new york right then for i think the new music seminar or something and so it made sense that they wanted a copy and I sent a copy out there to them. And so that's the copy they had and the picture of, I mean, that's the copy they had. So they took the picture and they knew it actually existed. It wasn't something that didn't exist yet. And so, uh, they put a lot of effort into that. <laughs> they put so much money in. It was just, you know, the amount of legal hours, they must've been at $200 an hour or whatever. It's just sort of, ridiculous um so eventually i mean i guess they were kind enough to work with me to say okay you can just cover it up um and you don't have to destroy them all and so then i had to go over i had to cover up every single mention of lysol on the thing and hire random people that i knew to come in and sit there and take speed and do the fucking stickering and just t- typing and doing over the marking over and all this god but it was just a that first day when he accused me of committing perjury in court i was like oh my god am i going to jail now like what's yeah, what's going on just go get from worse to worse so it, yeah. it's act- the fact that they let you cover up that stuff is actually a surprising result um, yeah, like they could have been real so I, assholes and they were on that path anyway. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe they had some legal reason that that was easy enough for them to do. I don't know how, but somehow they were agreeable to it. Mm-hmm. And the weirdest thing was that a lot of the stuff was already over at the, uh, the European distributor in, uh, in England in advance and it was sitting in their warehouse. And so they had to do the same thing over there oh. and they were really confused because, the Lysol brand does not exist in Europe. So they're like, what the hell is this Lysol? Is this Lysol? <laughs> what the fuck are we doing here? What the is going on? But they actually had to have some lawyer go in there and check them all. And we had to have a lawyer come in to our warehouse and check all the things to make sure they were properly covered up. And So you just had to order like, you just had to make a whole bunch of little blank or black tape that was at a uh, certain size yeah, to cover it. Yeah, I don't remember. They were, I was trying to, I mean, I'm such a cheapskate. I was trying to figure out some way to have to do this. And uh, I don't know. I think I couldn't find, I couldn't find black stickers. So I had to take white ones. I had to spray paint them black. And then uh, I had to, the, a regular marker wouldn't work on the coated paper. So I had to buy special markers that, that would work on glossy things or something. I don't know. Uh but yeah, I had to I had to unwrap them all and take the, you know take the CDs all apart and take the, and uh, do the stickers and do all this shit and it just uh, it took uh, a few weeks for sure you know of drudgery right taping over the thing then you had to mark over the 
the spine. And, yeah. And, and the, all the, the records, you had to mark over all the spines, which is easy enough. You put them all in a row and go boom, 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 boom. And, you know, apparently you could just sort of wipe it off pretty easily, too, if you wanted to. And then all the stickers on the cover and the CDs were a little harder because you actually had to unwrap them and take it all apart and take the, the back cards out and the oh, books out, you know, take them all apart and put them all back together. And then I had to figure out, I had to get them all wrapped again. And for some reason, I couldn't find a good way to shrink wrap them again. Or like, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was just only because I was a cheapskate and didn't want to pay extra money. But somehow I couldn't find anywhere to get them shrink wrapped. So I had to buy plastic bags, you know, and then put them all in the plastic bags and seal them up that way. And so they all looked crappy. They looked like, you know, used CDs and used records, mm-hmm. but it was better than throwing them away. <laughs> that sounds like a very, um, a bit of a traumatic experience. <laughs> it made you it question was. everything from that point. I on. lost sleep. I lost sleep for a few nights from it, for sure. I mean, it was really just... Well, those are quite collectible as well. And I think that's just the the story behind them. And then a few escaped without that sort of treatment on them. Yeah, I know the ones, I mean, I think I'd given them some to the band. So they probably had, you know, 20, 30 copies there. So they probably gave those to special friends or whatever they did with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure I saved a few. I know I had a few. I think right now I have one one original i think i have an original cd and original cassette as that's that's all i have so there weren't too many that got out but probably in a lot of them you could wipe off the the marker and you could probably if you worked hard at it you could get the sticker off that it would look you know new so that's all it took so there was one other parody the sub pop parody melvin's and steel oh, right, yeah, right i'm assuming so- that seemed to go a lot smoother than I saw. But- no, they, they actually knew about that. Um, oh, that was uh, that was Buzz's idea. I think he originally, it was sort of like they had the Mud Honey Sonic Youth Sub Pop 7-inch, uh, mm-hmm. 12-inch, I don't remember. Um, and so then Buzz wanted to do something. I think he originally was going to be them and Nirvana, or, you know, when he was just sort of, giving out wild ideas like and then they would do like Melvin's would do mud honey and Nirvana would do Sonic I don't remember what it was so then eventually but uh it, it got together with Melvin's and Steel Bull Bathtub where uh Melvin's did mud honey and Steel Bull Bathtub did Sonic Youth and uh Steel Bull Bathtub remade uh the Sonic Youth cover you know they redid the art to look like you know, it wasn't exact, but it was in that motif or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and Melvin's just said, let's use the exact same fucking cover yeah. as mine. And you're like, whatever, just use that cover. So that's what we did. We just took a picture of that and did it. And then I made the, uh, I had to make the the special sub pop label. I had to figure out how to make it by hand. You know, and I wasn't really an expert graphic artist, but I had to like, okay, there's all the little stars and there's this and this and whatever. And I remember I sent it down to uh, where we got the records made. And they, uh, it turned out they were the ones who made Sub Pops records also. So actually they called me up and just want to make sure, is this going to be okay? I mean, we just want to have, we just, but we're not going to get in trouble for this. Or, And so I had to call up Sub Pop to make sure it would be okay. And then the plant down there said, well, you know, we can, we can just use the same plates or whatever that we use for the sub pop labels and just use, instead of using your artwork we can just use the actual sub pop artwork and uh, for these labels and look better and be much uh, mm-hmm. easier and I'm like yeah that'd be great so that's what happened uh, so it uh, it came out really nice and then i told the it was sort of you know making fun of collectible stuff or colored vinyl and this and that there's all that sub pop singles club happening and people were getting out of hand with it and so we just decided to make the stupidest collectible thing we could and uh, i just told the the pressing plant to just make you know every single color imaginable and they just went through it and kept changing the colors around and so there's there's millions of different color i mean we, we think we made 700 and most of them are kind of unique because the colors all mixed together as it goes along. 
Oh, which which pressing plant was this? I think it was Alberti. It was either Alberti or Rainbow. Okay. I think it was Alberti. They went out of business at the end of the 90s, but uh, that's who I used for most of the stuff back then. Rainbow also went out of business. And at one point, there was a scramble for people to get their plates. They were storing all the plates of, of the old. It, it happened in Alberti, too. And I didn't I didn't get, I mean, I would have had to travel down to Los Angeles in order to to pick stuff up. And it was kind of like everything at that point, no one was buying records anymore anyway. Yeah. So it didn't really matter. So a lot of my stuff got thrown away at, uh, at Alberti's there. I know someone, because I saw someone selling selling one of the melvin's plates or what you know uh on ebay mm. <laughs> so it's like where the hell did you get that i took it out of the garbage at alberti <laughs> it's like, oh, all right whatever so one other thing i wanted to bring up is the band duh um sure. i love that band i actually i discovered them when i found a copy of the unholy hand job in a burger king parking lot <laughs> But you you formed Duh. You were kind of one of the original Duh founders. Yeah. Well, the 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 record you're talking about was a whole different imposter Duh. But um. Oh. Okay. Was, the original Duh was me and uh, Mike Moraski from Steel Pool Bathtub and Bob McDonald singing and Gary Held who owned uh, who owns Revolver USA, the distributor and Tupelo Records and stuff. Um, so we formed uh, in 1990, I think, and then uh, we released the record Blowhard in 92. And then soon after that, we broke up. I think I, we went on tour in Europe with Steel Pool Bathtub and then in 92. And after we got back, soon, sometime soon after that, we kind of fell apart and didn't stop playing. And then... Greg Workman from Alternative Tentacles was forming a band. And as I heard it, apparently he asked Bob McDonald, the singer, what should we call our band? And Bob said, why don't you just call it Duh? And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, then, so then they formed uh, a completely different Duh with, with new members and um, playing, you know, none of the same songs that I, as far as I know, and just a completely different thing. Uh. But it kind of went with the spirit of the whole the whole stupidity of the band that it's, you know, an imposter band would form. And so they and then they released a record that looked pretty much just like the one we we mm -hmm. made, except the picture on the front now was of Bob McDonald, our old singer, instead of being some weird disabled person. So were you aware the record, of any of this? you love is the, the crappy one that's it's terrible. <laughs> What I'm, what I'm saying. And the, the good one is the one that I played on, which came out a few years earlier. Okay. Got it. No <laughs> wonder they're, they, they seem very different. The credits are all smart ass too. You don't know what to believe. Yeah. Yeah. There's. Okay. Did you ever see duh, the, the imposter? I did duh? see them. I saw them. I think I saw them the first show they might've played where some people were confused because like the doves and we are not, you know, famous or anything like that but people around town knew who we were and so some people were at the show very confused as to, well, what is this band who, who the hell and so yeah i think that was the only time i saw them was might have been their first show the best thing about their first show was they needed they wanted to get t-shirts and i told greg that uh, well you know I have these uh, t-shirts left over from when, from our band and you can just buy those. You don't have to make new ones or anything. So he came in and, you know, took about three dozen t-shirts that cost off my hand. So it was a good deal for me again. <laughs> Another intertwining of reality. Now with, with, with Boda Records of the history of you know, Melvin Steel, Pulp Bathtub, several bands have, started at Boner, had part of their career at Boner before going to, you know, major label or, or, or other, other spots with the explosion of the music in the early nineties, were there any overages of larger labels coming with interest of purchasing Boner records? No, no interest in purchasing. Um, uh, no, not at all. There was, um, when the Melvins released Houdini, their first major label thing, um, I was offered, but 
but to press the vinyl but it was through i guess the melvins just asked me to, if i wanted to do it and, and i kind of didn't really want to it just didn't seem just didn't seem worth it like uh you know the reason i put out records is to be in on the whole creative to to be like involved and in put making this thing and putting it out to the public and having a part in that and to just press the vinyl for their record like something that was already made it was like well what's the i mean i probably could make a little bit of money doing that but it's kind of like what's the what's the point in that mm -hmm. <laughs> so i didn't uh, it wasn't it wasn't it's kind of a, a hard thing to explain but it just didn't seem didn't seem to have any enjoyment factor in doing that so i didn't do it um and they, so they ended up having Infetting Reptile do it instead, which, and he actually called me to make sure it was okay with me that they were doing it. And, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, it's no. Appa no. Yeah. We talked to Tom about that. Apparently Atlantic actually just paid for the pressing and just sent him the records to sell. Yeah. I mean, even... it seems like, well, so what, that's kind of like, what's the fun in that? <laughs> like, what's, what's the point? Well, it's like, also yeah. like, okay, am I going to owe someone for this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, whatever. Am I going to owe someone a favor or something for right. just. I think it's sort of sort of missing the and it's you know the whole thing you don't you don't want to be involved as much in like if they're pretending to be an independent label like if they want to make vinyl why don't they just put the vinyl out why do they want to have this you know to launder it through this independent label mm -hmm. to make it seem cool to the right people or you know i don't know it just seemed a little off-putting i didn't really want to be involved right. but no one ever no one ever came with any offers to me to, 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 to sell out. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Well, fair enough. So you continued making music into the 90s. You decided to put the pause button on for a while. Right. Like, where were you at in your life? What, what helped you make that decision? It was kind of in a way like all these bands, uh, you know, Melvin's went to major label and Steel Bull Bathtub went to major label and, uh, it just sort of seemed like there was less interest in the kind of music I was putting out. Like the last few things I put out, like sales had really gone down. And uh, uh, I went on a tour with my band Star Pimp in like 1997, I guess. And it just seemed obvious that the interest just was not happening. Uh, and it just seemed like it wasn't really like a problem with my band. It was sort of a problem with the whole scene i was involved in somehow you know i don't know what what actually the deal was so i just lost interest in uh in doing it and i didn't really i stopped it stopped being fun trying to do promotion and all this other stuff and because it started out almost like as a the way i was doing the label is almost like a parody of a record label like every every bio i put out would be like lies and every ad would just have in jokes and weird shit on it and um but that kind of got old where you know i couldn't keep doing the same type of thing over and over again and it just uh the whole business aspect of it and trying to compete with majors and promote the way they do it just seemed like what's the point forget it mm -hmm. so i you know i felt like i had enough uh income coming in and i didn't really need to do this anymore and it wasn't fun so i stopped doing it for a while oh, okay did you focus on other creative ventures music or anything? yeah it's no I, I thought i would start making films for a while but then uh that kind of ended up being harder than <laughs> <laughs> i mean because i i uh i'm not a good collaborator i'm not a good at getting together with other people and collaborating and uh, meeting people and doing networking and all that kind of stuff and especially for film work you need to have a whole crew doing shit uh, together and wouldn't work for me but uh, i like being in bands and being able to do my stuff was was boda records pretty much yourself i mean did you ever have like uh, you know multiple people working with it you was almost always myself um i had a few employee i had like one employee for a while and i had and actually, Mike from Steel Bobata sort of worked for a few months. Um, and they're always like sort of part time. There's never a lot to do. But then I shared a warehouse with um, with uh, Revolver USA, the distributor. And so in that way, um, they were able to sell all our stuff direct to a whole lot of stores. Um, 
And so I got a lot of help that way and for uh, as far as distribution and not needing a lot of other people. But uh, it was almost always just me doing everything, like doing designing all the ads, doing the promotion, sending out the promotional copies, uh, uh, these laying out the record covers, you know, calling up the distributors, shipping to the distributors, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> right, right. So it was, it was pretty much a, largely a one man show, but you had uh, casuals that helped you during peak periods. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so recently, you've got this Antler family record. Now, what preempted stepping back into the creative world? Well, uh, yeah, about ten years ago, I started. I started playing again. I played in a band with uh, the old singer from Fang, and uh, called Cornelius Asperger. And we put out a CD, and then uh, after that stopped, I started playing with Antler Family. This would have been like 2016, and uh, so the next for the next three years or so, we played shows, and we ended up recording a whole album. And then there was the pandemic came along, mm. and. Uh, so we couldn't play shows anymore and just sort of people split apart and did weird different stuff and um, just in the last year or so we've gotten gradually back together again and um finally put out this stuff to be recorded five years ago mm -hmm. um finally got it out on vinyl and uh that just uh, was a few weeks ago when that came out now obviously there's been changes from when you were pressing vinyl in the 80s and early 90s to now you know what what sort of changes in the whole production process not just vinyl but the packaging and marketing and everything you know is that uh, are you comfortable with those changes uh the changes are um well for vinyl for some reason it takes like six months to get anything made um because something where other than the pressing plants have closed down and they still haven't opened new ones back up because they don't know when it's gonna this fad is gonna <laughs> stop again um uh it's very expensive nowadays which i don't know if that's all inflation i think you know i don't know what it is but uh plus you just don't sell nearly as many i mean I, when when i made things in the 90s or uh anything any piece of garbage you put out you'd sell two thousand copies you know, just putting it out to distributors that go out to stores and people buy it. And I guess a lot of it is uh, people don't listen to music that way as much anymore. They listen to it digitally, just like I do. Um, so they don't buy as much vinyl. They just, you know, mm -hmm. they uh, subscribe to Spotify or whatever, and they can hear whatever they want that way. So it's, uh, it's a much more, what a boutique kind of thing where you're just mm -hmm. like, you know, you just make a few hundred copies and sell them for a lot of money and uh, to the people that want a actual product to hold in their hand, I guess. And you you got a limited pressing here. What what sort of quantities are there on Antler Family? 250. Um, wow. And uh, it's a very involved pressing. Uh, it's, it's a nice color. It's a nice uh, creamy. It's Antler Fam. Antler, <laughs> Antler okay. colored. All right. So it's like, you know, I think they might call it bone. I'm not sure. And it has a nice kind of gloss, uh, spot gloss on the cover. It looks real nice. The thing looks really nice. I mean, it was an expensive, expensive thing. If we sell out of the 250, we're ready to go on more, you know, so we'll see what happens. And why the name Antler Family? How did that come about? Uh, I don't know. We just threw, we're throwing around a bunch of names and somehow, I mean, I've heard of bands before that were something, something family. It always, it always kind of seemed neat to me, you know, uh, the so-and-so family, this family, Partridge family, you know, I don't know. Um, so Antler family, I don't know, I just said it had a nice ring to it. it. It's, of course, when you're thinking of names, it has, you know, there's four people and everyone's always going to hate something. And so you have to, if you come up with something that everyone says like, oh, okay, that's, that's good enough, then it's like, great, we're set, let's go. Do you have any other band names kind of in your pocket just in case you need to uh, pull them out? Yeah, I don't have any. Uh, I always wanted to have a band stump fetish, but uh, no one has gone for that one yet. <laughs> Someone's going to steal it now. 
I like antler family. It's kind of uh, almost that uh, iamic pentameter. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it just had a nice sound to it. I don't know, nice friendly, uh, mm -hmm. friendly but kind of dark in the same way. I don't know. I, now, you know. are you are you starting to play live again? Yeah, yeah, we play well. Yeah, we uh, we played in the few months ago, and we're going to be playing again in March in San Francisco. And so, uh, um, yeah, we're on the we're full on. Okay, so this may, this project may be for quite some time. This may be the first of a few Antler Family releases. Yeah, yeah, because we uh, we have new songs. I don't know if it's full albums worth yet, but uh, um, so we're, we should go in studio again at some point. And uh, you know, this time we won't wait five years in order to put the things out. You know? Right. Okay. <laughs> Make things time. <laughs> well, hopefully, there's not another pan pandemic. Uh, Okay, so I, I'm I'm a little lost as to where to direct people to order Antler Family. I went to Forced Exposure, but they're out of stock. Oh well, it can you can go through Midheaven, okay. Midheaven .com, or you can order direct from us at Bandcamp or uh, Oh Bank. Okay, what's the Bandcamp? Uh, it's, yeah, Antler it's Antler Family. I don't know. Uh, I don't know yeah. the exact. Oh, it is AntlerFamily.Bandcamp.com, and yes, twelve inch. Oh, very good. 25 bucks. What a bargain. I All saw right. it. Uh, it's on Amazon too, but they were selling it for $71. <laughs> and I don't know how, where they're getting that figure from. Cause I know they're not, they're just buying it at a regular, <laughs> you know, 20 something, whatever dollars. So I don't know where they're jacking it up to 71, but uh, Jeez. you don't have to, you, you don't have to go to Amazon unless you have a special love for Amazon. You can buy it for much cheaper. Uh, right. A lot of, Okay, yeah, there it is. Buy it direct from the band antlerfamily.bandcamp.com. So you're bit back busy with Antler Family, um, and Boner Records seems to have been revived. And anything else going on? Well, I'm in a band, a second band called Suboptics, so they play guitar and also. Um, so we should be recording sometime soon as well, and uh, we'll see what happens. We sure have enough songs too, so, you know. You got a lot of stuff going on. You got more energy than I do. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll be looking. Is there any anything on Bandcamp for them? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's actually there's a uh, there's a three song demo we recorded. It's not uh, it's not you know a vinyl release, but it's a demo stuff you can listen to there or purchase there if you wanted to. But uh, Suboptics is it Headworm Rocket? Yes, that's it. There we go. Okay, I'll put that link in this episode page as well. Um, yeah, three songs up there. All right. Well, Tom, thank you very much for uh, for joining us here and, and being patient with the record nerd questions. Uh, you did really well, by the way. I have very, very good memory. And uh, yeah, nothing. No, like nothing an honorary different. nerd or something. You kind of are a record nerd. You may not know it or recognize it. You need to, <laughs> you could self-identify as a record nerd and, and know how right. to question it. <laughs> I want to call people's attention to Antler Family, antlerfamily.bandcamp.com. Again, 250 records. Um, so grab one, an antler colored copy at antlerfamily.bandcamp.com and check out Suboptics, suboptics.bandcamp.com. I'll put those links in this episode page. And Tom, thank you very much for uh, for joining us here. And uh, again, good luck with uh, with all these projects going forward. Glad to see Boner. The Boner flag is still flying. Yeah, yeah, well, I'll be here forever. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Ah, there we go. Lots of history there, kiddos. Thank you, Tom Flynn of Boner Records for coming on. I always wondered what happened to that label. Um, I thought they were long gone, but glad to see they were only hibernating and now they've reawakened. So again, antlerfamily.bandcamp.com. And thank you, Tom. You're welcome back to the show anytime. And that's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, make sure you follow The Vinyl Guide podcast in your podcast app. You got to click the little follow button. I think it's in Spotify and, of course, at the top of the screen on Apple Podcasts. Make sure you click that button because that way, whenever we come out with an episode, it lets you know something new's going on and uh, you 
could enjoy it right away. And of course, thank you to everyone who's leaving positive reviews. You know, if you haven't yet, you can too. Go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, say something really nice, rate us five out of five or something swell, and uh, we do appreciate that. And we'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time, get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers. Cheers.